what does this airplane, this airplane, and th wait, what? This has something in common with the other two? You're kidding. Well, let's find out in Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machette. By request, special thanks to viewer Alan Branch for the great idea for this program. What these three diverse aircraft have in common is that at one time in their career, they served as motherships. Now, when you hear the term mothership, you think of the X-planes in the 1950s at Edwards, like this Bell X-2 that was dropped by an EB-50 you see in the background with all the personnel and equipment. And we'll be covering that later in the program. But let's start at the beginning. In 1933, carrying up to five single-seat Curtis F-9C Sparrowhawks for aerial scouting, the USS Macon served as a flying aircraft carrier for the U.S. Navy. The 785-foot-long rigid airship could also carry two larger fleet N2Y biplanes for training and courier purposes, flying Navy personnel to and from the giant airship. Knowing that aircraft could fly with greater payloads than possible at takeoff, the short Mayo composite was an ingenious concept for providing long-range air service between Great Britain, North America, and the far reaches of the British Commonwealth in 1938. Built by Short Brothers and operated by Imperial Airways, the 18-passenger S-21 flying boat carried the short S-20 Mercury, a twin-float, four-engine seaplane, flown by a single pilot and navigator who sat in tandem in an enclosed cockpit. The combined power of both aircraft brought the smaller seaplane to its service ceiling, where the two airplanes would separate. The carrier aircraft would return to base while the other flew airmail on to its destination. Although never practical for passenger service, these novel airplanes flew from Ireland and Scotland to Canada, Egypt, and South Africa, a distance of 6,000 miles, which was unheard of in 1938. Discovered by Allied forces at the end of World War II, German Mistels were an attempt to deliver large flying bombs to targets on the Russian front, with FW-190 or BF-109 pilots guiding an unmanned Ju-88 to the target before releasing it as a glider. The war ended before these could be flown operationally. But during the post-war years, B-17s were used to test the concept of bombers flying close to a target then releasing JB-2 Loon buzz bombs as standoff weapons in the first use of what eventually became air-launched cruise missiles. The world's first piloted ramjet airplane was the French Leduc 010, a predecessor to the Model 021 shown here. Air launching from a Sudest SE-161 mothership was required to accelerate the Leduc to its 200 mile per hour flying speed. Let's take a look at the three models of this unique ramjet airplane. The 010 flew 620 miles an hour at 40,000 feet in 1949. The model 021 achieved a speed of 640 miles an hour and climbed to 66,000 feet in 1953, while the supersonic model 022 flew at Mach 1.15 or 750 miles per hour in 1957. These three pioneering aircraft made an impressive total of 380 flights under ramjet power. And now we come to the X-planes. Starting with the Bell X-1, the first airplane to reach Mach 1 and achieve an altitude of 70,000 feet in 1947. The X-1 had a unique mating system. It was uh, backed into a cement pit built into the ramp at Edwards, or at that time, Muroc, uh, in uh, California. Uh, the B-29 that you see in the background, the mothership, was then towed into position. And note that there are no main landing gear doors on the B-29, as those would have impinged on the wings of the X-1 when mated. But here you see the tractor, and the X-1 is uh, shackled into the bomber at this point, a rare color photo from the Edwards History Office. And here we see the B-29 climbing for altitude. You notice the open cockpit door and the bottom of the elevator that the pilot would ride down to uh, enter the X-1. The bottoms of these airplanes were painted black to mitigate the uh, extreme glare 
that the pilots would have seen uh, dropping from a dark bomb bay into a bright sunlight. Here we see Chuck Yeager uh, entering the elevator as he climbs out of the pressure bulkhead uh, behind the cockpit. And in 1996, uh, I was commissioned by General Yeager to paint the 50th anniversary commemorative image of his supersonic flight in 1947. It was a wonderful project. I got to fly with the general and work with uh, both him and his chase pilot seen here in this image, who was none other than Bob Hoover. And you remember I mentioned the pit at Edwards, and before I delivered the painting, uh, after a special uh, uh, procedure, I was able to take the painting into the pit and have the canvas of my painting touch the same ground that the X-1 touched 50 years earlier. Next is the Douglas Skyrocket, first airplane to fly Mach 2. Originally designed for ground launch using JATO Assist, the uh, rocket-powered Skyrockets were made into a B-29 mothership, seen here elevated on hydraulic lifts built into the ramp at Edwards South Base. One of my all-time favorite flying photos, the supersonic shape of the Skyrocket juxtaposed against the lines of the World War II bomber as it climbs for altitude. Here we see the actual moment of launch and notice the large cutout in the aft fuselage of the B-29 uh, to allow clearance for the Skyrocket's tail. Here you can see the doublers on the fuselage for extra strength. And again, just a classic image of air progress in the 1950s. That B-29 carried an amazing uh, nose art. It was nicknamed Fertile Myrtle and shows the stork uh, delivering the baby rocket plane. A very novel idea and an iconic uh, piece of nose art. The Bell motherships that carried the uh, X-1 and the X-1A that you see here had the baby Bell logo with the stork uh, delivering the uh, rocket airplane, as you see. The second generation Bell X-1A, B, and D featured a stretched fuselage and fighter-type cockpit. These airplanes reached Mach 2 and 90,000 foot altitudes. The X-1C was to have tested supersonic armament, but it was never built. Confirming the dangers of rocket-powered flight, both the X-1A and X-1D were lost in in-flight explosions and were jettisoned from their motherships. The sole remaining X-1B is displayed in the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force in Dayton, Ohio. Here we see a launch, F-86 chase plane. And uh, this is a good view of the extended fuselage on the X-1A. This is the airplane that uh, Chuck Yeager flew to Mach 2.44. And here we see Yeager and Kit Murray uh, painting nose art, uh, supposedly on the X-1A, uh, connoting their record flights. The Bell X-2 was the first airplane to fly three times the speed of sound and the first airplane to fly outside the Earth's atmosphere above 100,000 feet in 1956. The second X-2 was actually delivered to Edwards first in April of 1952, while Ship 1 remained in uh, at the Bell plant in Buffalo, New York for engine testing. That airplane was delivered in July of 1954, and here we see the demating procedure uh, we're using the hydraulic elevators on South Base. I should mention that these are still in the ground in what is now a parking lot at South Base, but you can see the elevators and the yellow lead-in stripes that you see in this photo still evident in that parking lot today. On the morning of May 12, 1953, during a captive propellant system test flown from the Bell Niagara Falls, New York plant, the second X-2 exploded over Lake Ontario and was lost along with test pilot Skip Ziegler, wearing the flight jacket at left, and Bell observer Frank Walco. Illustrating the potential hazards of rocket plane mothership operations, the EB-50 was damaged beyond repair and never flew again. The X-2, because it landed on a skid, uh, required a ground handling dolly that you see here, and this was used for the uh, mating procedure, uh, pushed into position by a uh, tow tug, Here's the two aircraft connected, and you can see all the plumbing, uh, the vent lines, and everything else 
as well as the, the uh, fuselage cutout for the tail of the X-2. It's a pretty complex procedure. Here we see the anti-sway bars on the uh, bottom of the wings of the bomber uh, to control the stability of the X-2 when mated. The X-2's EB-50 mothership was flown by a crew of nine, five on the flight deck and four observers in the fuselage seen at right wearing high altitude cold weather gear. That's famed X-2 test pilot, Captain Ivan Kinchlow, kneeling in front. Here's Captain Fitz Fulton, who was personally selected by Lieutenant Colonel Pete Everest, then Chief of Flight Test, to fly the motherships uh, in the 1950s. This began a long career. We're going to see Fitz and a few other airplanes later in the program. The X-2 pilot uh, rode in the bombardier station in the nose of the B-50 on its uh, flight up to altitude before the release. And here we see the takeoff. Again, uh, an interesting juxtaposition of shapes in 1956. Because of the swept wings of the X-2, the B-50 was able to retain its main gear uh, doors. Here's a nice color photo of the airplane climbing to altitude. The uh, X-2's engines are now uh, pressurized, propellants are jettisoning. And there's the moment of launch as the X-2 rocketed into history. This is a rare photo taken from the nose of the B-50 looking down as the X-2 rockets away from the mothership, and then seconds later is heading into the stratosphere uh, and toward the unknown. Originally intended to be carried by a Convair B-36, the XF-85 was tested with a B-29 appropriately named Monstro. First flown in 1948, the Goblin was powered by a single Westinghouse J-34 turbojet and brought into focus problems inherent with in-flight hookups of jet and piston aircraft. Here's the XF-85 on a ground handling dolly at Edwards minus its large nose hook and landing skid. After many mostly unsuccessful test flights, the Goblin was canceled and never used operationally. But an airplane that did serve as an operational fighter-carrying bomber was the Convair GRB-36D FICON, or Fighter Conveyor. Initial tests were conducted with the Republic YF-96, or F-84F Thunderstreak prototype, seen in this photo sequence being retracted into the B-36's bomb bay after attaching to the bomber's trapeze. The airplane used for limited FICON operations with the 99th Strategic Reconnaissance Wing at Fairchild Air Force Base in Washington was the Republic RF-84K, shown here with a dummy nuclear weapon. Here the Thunder Flash is in its specially built mating pit at Fairchild in 1955. The short-lived FICON program was replaced by the high-flying Lockheed U-2 spy plane. Here we see a Lockheed DC-130 mothership carrying Ryan Firebee drones. Uh, these were very effective in uh, ECM, electronic countermeasures, radar jamming, photo recon, and were used in the Vietnam era. Intended to augment the Mach 3 capability and effective range of Lockheed's SR-71 Blackbird, the ramjet-powered Lockheed D-21 photo surveillance drone was to be launched from its M-21 mothership to fly over denied territory at Mach 3 and then jettison a photo package for in-flight retrieval by a DC-130 after returning to friendly territory. A test launch in July 1966 turned tragic when the D-21 collided in midair with the M-21 mothership, resulting in the loss of both aircraft and the death of the M-21's backseater. The pilot was able to eject, however, and did survive. The remaining D-21s were launched on operational missions of up to 3,000 miles from two specially uh, configured B-52H aircraft, one of which is still flying at Edwards Air Force Base today. This is the original nose art painted on that B-52, serial number 610036. In 2017, I was commissioned to repaint that nose art on the same aircraft at Edwards. And here's my design. It was a great project. Uh, I got to paint the bomber in the iconic Hangar 1600 on the flight line, seen in this photo in 1957. But it is amazing to see this airplane flying today 
wearing a revised nose art that was first painted 50 years earlier. Now we get to the X-15 program, the most successful research aircraft ever flown. Here we see the X-15A2. This airplane reached a speed of Mach 6.7. Earlier X-15s reached uh, altitudes as high as 354,000 feet, all in the 1960s. X-15s were carried to launch altitude by Boeing B-52 motherships. There were two. Falls 3 was nicknamed the High and Mighty One, a B-52A while Balls 8 was originally named the Challenger, and this was an NB-52B. Again, Fitz Fulton commanded this, uh, these aircraft, and at right you see a list of the dedicated flight crews who manned the B-52 throughout the nine-year X-15 program. X-15 takeoffs were always made to the east on runway 04. In the event of a runway overrun or aborted takeoff, the mothership would simply roll out on the lake bed with no obstructions. Here we see the B-52 climbing to altitude, rather dramatic shot. You see the shadow of the X-15 against the fuselage. And if you look on the forward fuselage, there's a round observation window for the launch operator. And this is the view as the X-15 reaches its launch altitude of 45,000 feet. As we turn on to launch heading, I'm gonna show you some artwork that depicts the launch. This is my painting of Scott Crossfield's final flight in the X-15 in December of 1960. And then I got to steal my own idea and uh, paint uh, Pete Knight's Mach 6.7 flight in the uh, ablative covered uh, X-15A2 in October, 1967. You know what? I've got an even better painting to show you the launch of an X-15. How about this? You didn't think I was going to do a video without a model box stop, did you? This is the great Jack Lenwood. The mothership salute was a uh, formality where the uh, B-52s would make a high-speed low pass over the X-planes or lifting bodies that had landed. Reason being that the uh, flights of X-15s and the lifting bodies were all of 8, 10, maybe 12 minutes at the longest, while the, the motherships took uh, almost an hour to return from altitude. And so uh, it was always tradition to make these uh, low passes in salute to the great crews. The lifting bodies. These were three odd-shaped aircraft, uh, the Martin X-24, Northrop M-2, and Northrop HL-10, that were the pivotal step between the X-15 and the space shuttle, proving that uh, wingless aircraft could generate enough lift to make controlled descents and landings. They reached Mach 1.8, 90,000 feet, and then would uh, rocket down and glide to a landing on the lake bed uh, in the same manner that the shuttle eventually did years later. The B-52 had to be modified with an ad adapter to the X-15 pylon seen here. And here's a beautiful shot of uh, Balls 3 taking the M2F2 on a test flight. This beautiful photo was taken by my dear friend Tony Landis and shows the NASA X-38 experimental reentry vehicle, which was envisioned as a rescue craft uh, for the International Space Station. The Space Shuttle. To prove the airworthiness of the shuttle orbiter during the final approach for landing, a series of five ALT, or approach and landing tests, were flown at Edwards in 1977. Once again, chief pilot for the 7-4, was Fitz Fulton now flying for NASA after retiring from the Air Force. It was during these tests that Fulton became known as Father of the Motherships. The first three test flights were flown with the streamlining tail cone uh, fitted to the shuttle, as you see here. The fourth and fifth flights were made with tail cone off. Drag from the mock-up rocket exhaust nozzles reduced flight times by 50%, from five minutes tail cone on to two minutes, 15 seconds from launch at 23,000 feet to the lake bed. If you ever wondered how shuttles were attached to the 747 for ferrying back to the Kennedy Space Center after landing at Edwards, it was in the mate demate facilities located at both centers. First, the shuttle orbiter was towed into the structure and then with tail cone attached would be raised up. The 747 was towed into position, 
and the shuttle was lowered onto the 747's support pylons. It is interesting to note that the forward support pylon used for ferrying shuttles was different from the taller one used to achieve precise angle of attack at separation on the ALT flights. Last hurrah for Balls 8 was launching the Mach 10 X-43A Scramjet in 2004. Scramjet stands for Supersonic Combustion Ramjet. After being boosted by a Pegasus rocket, the X-43 accelerated to Mach 10, or 7,400 miles per hour, uh, generating data for 12 seconds before gliding down to a planned crash landing in the ocean. Balls 8 was replaced with two newer B-52H motherships seen below, and these are still flying at Edwards today. As a harbinger of space tourism, Scale Composites Spaceship One became the first privately funded commercial craft to reach space in March of 2004. Its mothership was the equally innovative White Knight, a name that is actually a clever play on words for the aircraft is named in honor of X-15 pilots Bob White and Pete Knight. Having flown the first operational suborbital spaceflight carrying five paying passengers just two weeks before this video was produced, Spaceship Two is finally proving Sir Richard Branson's dream of flying commercially in space. It would have been inconceivable to me when I was watching the first X-15 flights in awe as a teenager back in the 1960s, to think that private citizens would fly those same profiles as space tourists within my lifetime. Speaking of commercial flights, these two 1970s-era former jumbo jet airliners were utilized as airborne-to-orbit launch vehicles, the Stargazer beginning in 1995 and Cosmic Girl in 2021. The final mothership in our program is the world's largest airplane, the Epic Strato Launch, named Rock after Sinbad's mythical giant bird that was so large it could carry an elephant. This is the airplane that finally broke the 75-year record for longest wingspan, which had been held by this airplane, the Howard Hughes H-4, better known as the Spruce Goose, which flew in 1947. Its wingspan was 321 feet, Strato launch, 385. Powered by six of the same Pratt & Whitney turbofans as on the Boeing 747-400, this mammoth machine will air launch heavier payloads into orbit than ever before possible. Let's look at the numbers. 238 feet long, a wingspan of 385 feet as mentioned, a max speed of 530 miles per hour, and a max payload of 550,000 pounds. That is the same takeoff weight as the original Boeing 777-200. Max gross takeoff weight of the Strato launch, 1,300,000 pounds. So from October 1947 to October 1977, we've seen just an amazing leap in aviation technology and mothership operational activity. And there you have it, a look at the motherships from the early 20th century to today. As always, special thanks to the wonderful people who support this channel and provide the imagery and information that makes this presentation possible. Thank you for celebrating aviation with Mike Machat. I hope you enjoyed this episode. We'd love to have you on board if you haven't subscribed already. And please do hit the like button on the way out. That does help us with YouTube. As always, until next time, take care.